Kiki Classic Rock. Uh, Kiki, say hi to Tony. Well, hello, Tony. Hey there, Kiki. How are you? I am doing wonderfully. How are you? Thank you for being with us tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the time. Well, I wanted to just give a quick introduction to everyone. You're known as the Fretless Monster. You've worked with literally hundreds of amazing musicians, cream of the crop musicians, including Whitesnake, Quiet Riot, Jimmy Page, Paul Rogers, and most recently, you're part of Lou Graham's all-star band, and from the firm to Donna Lewis, and your hair, Tony, was really, probably, one of the biggest in the 80s, and I heard that you did it yourself, so everybody... Tony Franklin. Well, quite an introduction there, Kiki. Thank you. It uh, covered most of it, I think. <laughs> All right. So that bye. No, just kidding. <laughs> so, did you really do your own hair? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I mean, uh, I just knew what I wanted. If I didn't, I'd figure it out. <laughs> How did you get it so tall, though? I mean, you really, you got it up there. Well, hey, that's that was a bit of a process. I mean, the 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 thing was, no, there's a lot of bleach and product in the hair, but no washing on show day. Oh. Absolutely no hair washing allowed, and then some back combing, uh, some strategically placed hairspray. I had the thing down. It would it'd take me five minutes. I'd do it on the way to the gig, and uh, boom, good to go. <laughs> I mean, I, I was looking at pictures of you and I said, wow, that's impressive because I couldn't even get my hair that tall. So good for you. Hey, well, <laughs> I tell you, if, if there was YouTube back then, I would have a, a uh, how to do big 80s hair YouTube channel. I'd be a YouTube star instead. You know what, Tony? I bet you could still do that today because the 80s are so hot and people would love it. Here's how I did my hair in the 80s and show everybody what you did. I could if I really, really wanted to, but I really, really don't want to. <laughs> well, Tony, you have the nickname of the Fretless Monster. Who gave that to you, and when did you get that name? Actually, I gave it to myself. That sounds very humble and, and boasting, doesn't it? But, uh, no. you know, fast forward, I've always been... I've always played the fretless bass. I still play fretted bass. One of the big mis misconceptions about me, misconceptions about me is that I only play the fretless. Well, the fretless has become my voice. Well, fast forward to 2003 and I was part of, I was playing SWR bass amps at the time and they were putting a catalog together of all their artists and so they would have those the Dean White of uh, Earth, Wind and Fire. There was Robbie Merrill of Godsmack. Um, all these different fantastic artists that were using, and so they put their name and what band they were associated with. And I really did not want to put 2003. Didn't want to put the Firm or Blue Murder. It was it was a few years ago, and it was kind of. It wasn't current. It didn't. It kind of was looking backwards. I wanted something to be kind of timeless. So it just literally popped in my head, said, put fretless monster. And and so they did. They said, oh, that's great. We love that. And it's, it's stuck since then. And it's kind of taken on its own life since then because people will see me and say, oh, it's the fretless monster. And they may not remember my name, but they know me as the fretless monster. And that does seem to be the case because a lot of people just call you that. Yeah, it's become the thing, and it's 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 cool. You know, I actually got a bit of stick for it because some of the there are other fretless players. Uh, you know, my hero Jacko Pastorius, and people say they're the real fretless monster. I said, hey, it's a fun nickname. Right. I'm not trying to say I'm better than them. We're all fretless players. We're all in this together. I have huge respect for them. It's just a fun nickname, and so. That's all it is. It's a lot of fun, and and it's stuck. But you really, I mean, to me, it seems like you were kind of a trendsetter because in the 80s, from what I read, a lot of people frowned upon fretless playing, or did they not? And then you just came in, here you are with the firm, and everybody was in love with it. Well, the fretless has, has been frowned upon 
in general, but especially in rock. Now, uh, no disrespect to the fretless bass, but you don't hear about it too much in rock music because there's, the style doesn't really lend itself to it. There's a lot of big, fat notes, and it's got to be perfectly in tune. And so the, the fretted is generally more suitable for that. I wasn't even thinking about trend setting or being anything other than what was true to me at that time. I was playing a lot of fretless bass and ended up in these situations that were hard rock. And so it was just a natural thing for me. So it, you don't realize until hindsight and years later that how unusual and if you want to call it groundbreaking it was because at the time you don't have that perspective i was just doing my thing and it felt right and you know, time and history writes the story doesn't it oh it sure does because then you were looked upon as wow we love that sound let's all use it <laughs> yeah but still i mean there are some great players in rock on the fretless but not so many still, because it it is surprisingly, you know, rock is, is thought of as being you know, a real kind of simple style to, to many. It's not, you don't need to be super qualified. And for a lot of, a lot of mu styles of music, that is the case. But, you know, there's, uh, that's, and I'm not trying to undermine my own um, style of uh, my genre and, and the other great players, but you know, fretless is more prominent now, but you don't always hear about it because the thing is with fretless, it can easily stand out in the wrong way. And if it doesn't suit the music and the right player can't put it across, then it can sound very bad. So but there are a lot of uh, great players out there playing rock on it. Now, the supergroup, The Firm, that you are part of, absolutely incredible. Chris Slade, Jimmy Page... Paul Rogers, it, it, I have to tell you, Tony, so many people, and I just said this to John Payne recently as well, everybody brings up Paul Rogers, such an icon, of, of course, Jimmy as well. And you, you were all the firm. 1983 was the year it all came together. Now, Paul and Jimmy already had a working relationship, but then you and Chris were brought in. How did all of you meld together? I mean, two humongous, already iconic musicians. How did that work from the get-go? Yeah, by the way, it was 1984 that it came together. Jimmy and Paul were working together with a thing on the Arms Tour, um, uh, um, multi this thing for Ronnie Lane, and they actually performed a song, Midnight Moonlight, which uh, became part of the firm's repertoire on that tour. And so Jimmy and Paul, of course, go back way, way back to the Bad Co. Swan Song label years. So they had... Uh, a, a strong rapport and connection and friendship. And so, you know, that, that Jimmy was still coming out of the shadow of his own shadows, if you like, but the shadow of Led Zeppelin and all of that that happened and the passing of John Bonham. So he was, uh, he was still finding his way. And so it was, it was quite a journey for him. And Paul was out of friendship, had, really been huge in Jimmy's life to help bring him out and encourage him to play more. Paul would go around to Jimmy's and they would just hang and play music and listen to music. And then they, after the arms tour happened, they decided, so shall we have a go of it? Now, I had I'd been working a lot with uh, British folk musician Roy Harper, who a lot of people will know from... Pink Floyd's Have a Cigar, as well as uh, the, the song um, Hats Off to Harper on Led Zeppelin 3. And so he and Jimmy, they knew each other very well. We ended up, cutting, cutting a long story short, but we did an album together in 1984 called Whatever Happened to Jugular, and it was the second or third one I'd done with Roy. And uh, Jimmy was involved in it, and the two of us, ended up connecting and, and getting along well. Now, so many aspects to this, and I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail because it's too much, but uh, I knew very little about Led Zeppelin. I knew nothing, actually. What? And so people ask me, how did you handle playing with Jimmy Page? Well, to me, he wasn't, and I saw this later, especially when we came to the States, 
how highly regarded and idolized he was. I wasn't like that. You didn't get see that so much in Britain. You didn't hear them on the radio. I was not exposed to any Led Zeppelin albums. Wow. And so I went into that situation not in awe of him. I was simply... We would wanted to make good music together. We played a few gigs with Roy, and it was just very natural, organic, very relaxed. And so there was no no kind of like a oh, superstar ego thing going on on any part. It was just like, hey, here we are. We want to make some good music. And so that continued. He called me to see if I wanted to you know, check out the the new thing. I'd not heard of Chris Slade. He and I connected instantly. I knew more about Paul Rogers uh, from free in in the UK, but knew nothing about Bad Company. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it was just going into that really not thinking, wow, I'm playing with these icons, these legends. No, it's like, hey, I I know who these guys are. I just want to go in, play music, and see what happens. And so it all felt very relaxed, natural, and organic. And it just carried on from there. And before you know it, we are recording the album, and then we're on tour, and the album came out, and, uh, and there you go. It was very relaxed and, and natural. And it just a, a, I mean, if I'd have gone in there and, you know, musically it was cool, but if the hang wasn't good, if we weren't kind of vibing and, getting on, then I probably probably wouldn't be talking about it now because it's more than just music. It's it's just being in there and getting along. And obviously, we uh, things worked out. So there you go. That's so cool, though. <laughs> I mean, really, that's just... And, and to go into it the way that you were able to, I, I think that's, that's just such a fortunate situation. It was very fortunate. And I, I honestly, my ignorance... I mean, I was 22 at the time. I obviously could play music pretty well, but as far as life and uh, knowing about a broad spectrum of music and being, you know, I was a very awkward, shy kid, really, who knew nothing beyond playing bass, to be honest. And so, but it served me well. My ignorance was actually ideal for that because I wasn't overwhelmed with it. I was just going in to play bass. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's a beautiful thing, and you you played bass real well. <laughs> and it well, worked. thank you. I do my best. <laughs> now, the guitar that you used on the second Firm album was stolen, and from what I read, it was discovered in a pawn shop. Who found it? Did you ever find out who stole it? What was the story there? Well, that bass actually, uh, I used it all through the second half of the Firm. A lot of touring with it. And I used it with the band that followed, Blue Murder. I recorded all the album with it and a lot of touring. And then I had essentially retired the bass. Uh, it was the, the, the 80s were done, and I returned back to the Fender because that's what I started on. Whole long story unto itself. And it got stolen out of a storage facility. And I didn't see it for, for many, many years. And then I, it, it did show up again. I, I, it was in somebody's place. And I think, yeah, I think it was not a pawn shop, but it was like, uh, it, it had, somebody was trying to sell it. And, and, and so it showed up and it's like, you know, at that point, I still didn't need it. And it's hard to imagine that now. I have the base back now. Oh, wow. And it's so emotional and, and meaningful to me. But at the time, I was like, okay, yeah, I kind of moved past that base for that time. And so a very good friend of mine, a collector of instruments who had instruments from Jack Bruce and some iconic instruments, loved Blue Murder. And so he he made me an offer I couldn't refuse with the, with the promise that if I ever wanted to see the bass and play it again, I could, I could at any point. And and so anyway, it came back to me, and I have it now, and it's like uh, being reunited with uh, uh, a lost dear friend. Yeah, I, I could only imagine because Peter Frampton had the same experience. Yes, yeah, the Phoenix, and we were on tour with uh, 
I did a tour with Jason Bonham in 2019, and we opened some shows for for Peter Frampton and saw that guitar and everything. It's still got the burn marks on it and everything. It's, uh, yeah, there is a very real emotional bond that you have with those instruments. And I, I, I totally feel that. Is it hard to imagine that there was a point where you didn't want it back? I, it is. It is really. But, uh, you know, it's, it, I, I get very philosophical ab- ab- about life because I'd started on, on the Fender bass, and uh, my first Fender bass I got in 1976, which I still own, and then all the first firm stuff, radioactive, was was done on the on the Fender bass, and so I've always had a connection to that. So, you know, I went back to that. It wasn't that I'd fallen out with with the JD that bass. It's just that I'd gone back to my to my roots, and I mean, ultimately, that led to the Fender Signature model in 2006, which is still in production. It's a, one of the longest-running signature instruments in the line. And so, you know, it's funny how things happen. If I'd have, uh, I went back to the Fender bass, and that has become my trademark, so to speak. So, but yes, in, in hindsight, it's like, how do you lose a friendship with somebody that you're, so super close with, but you know how it is with friendships. You can not see a good friend for twenty years or so, and then you see them, and you pick up just where you left off. Right. So it's it's like we ne- we didn't fall out. We just you know we didn't see each other for a few years. And also, we we all get to different stages of our lives too. You know, it's maybe you didn't want it at that time. Maybe you just it, 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 like you said, it wasn't something in your wheelhouse at that point. Well, yeah, absolutely. And there are different phases. I mean, you know, that that bass was also, as well as some amazing heights and successes and recordings, I mean, I played that bass on the much-viewed Kate Bush, David Gilmore video, that, that uh, performance from 1987 of Running Up That Hill, which, of course, that song has had a lot of attention so recently. So, um, you know... But also that that base was of an era where I was pretty reckless, out of control, partying, living the rock and roll lifestyle. So there was a part of that base that was associated with that era. And when that base, when I put that base down, I also stopped that crazy lifestyle. And that was back in 1990 that all that stopped. I'd had enough of it and just turned my life around. So there is an association with that as well, interestingly enough. Wow. That's, I I mean, that makes so much sense. So much sense. Now, 1985, I feel like that was one of the best years of the decade. I mean, Madonna, Phil Collins, Dire Straits. Who was the most fun artist or group that you got to work with during that time? It's hard to top the firm. I mean, yeah, at the time, I, I say knew very little about Jimmy and, and Paul and Chris. But, you know, to be, I mean, people ask me what was one of the most memorable moments of your career. Well, playing at Madison Square Garden with Jimmy Page and Paul Rogers. Sold out crowd, no opening act. For 10 minutes of that night, remember, it's 1985, the days of the big bass solos. So for 10 minutes of that night, it was just me on the stage with a sold-out crowd going berserk. And so it's it's really hard to top that. And, of course, I knew nothing about the history of, of Jimmy and Madison Square Garden and all those legendary performances with Led Zeppelin there. Aside from everything else, I was thrilled to be there because... I knew the Queen had played there, and they, they were my my top band of growing up. And so, you know, but then it's like you find out all this stuff pretty soon afterwards, but then more and more you find out stuff about what a legendary venue. I mean, we had our own plane. We had, we had uh, uh, our own limousines. We were staying in the Four Seasons hotels everywhere. It was just, it, it's hard to, to beat that. And so, 
you know, that really, and that was me at 22, 23, 24, thinking that the rest of my life was going to be that way. <laughs> of course it wasn't. You're, you're quickly humbled by, by life. Mm-hmm. But honestly, it's, it's hard to, to beat that. And I've played with some amazing people and there've been some incredible highlights through it all. But, you know, it's like your first love, isn't it? That one was hard to beat. Yeah. Oh, wow. And and just you even talking about it, honestly, I get chills, really, I because that had to be just such an incredible experience. Oh, yeah. And it's, I mean, I talk about it because I wasn't fully able to grasp it and appreciate it and have the perspective of it that you gain with time. I mean, me talking about it now, and here's the other thing as well. The day after that show, and I'm not sure if you know who Jaco Pastorius is, but uh, he he was the reason that I played fretless bass. He was an iconic fretless bass player, more known in the jazz and the fusion worlds. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, he was playing the night after in New York City at a place called the Lone Star Cafe. And and we had a day off, and I saw it in the paper. And I told Chris and I told Jimmy about it. I called up Jimmy and said, hey, Jaco Pastorius is playing at the Lone Star Cafe. Do you want to come? And, uh, and he, Jimmy wasn't aware of Jaco at that time. Chris knew who he was. And so uh, Jimmy ended up jamming with him. Uh, Jaco convinced him. And so, you know, it was, and I've become friends with the Pastorius family since. And they said, you know, Jaco sadly passed away in 1987. He was, um, he, he was, uh, had, what do you call it? Oh, bipolar, which was very under misunderstood at that point, mm-hmm. and it took his life. <sighs> and so, you know, they, they spoke of that, how it was a highlight in Jocko's life, and he was so excited about it. And, you know, it's, there are so many stories and sub-stories, which, as you know, I... Um, I have not been doing too many interviews because there's so much to talk about, and I'm putting a lot of this in a memoir, because there are so many incredible angles and stories and sub-stories and everything that go along with it. But to have been part of all of that is, is just... Uh, it's my, my life is like a cross between uh, a fairy tale and spinal tap. <laughs> and so the story well, that's interesting. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, honestly, before before I started talking to you this evening, your resume, yeah, thank you. no, your your resume is unbelievable. I, I'm, I said we need a couple of pages here just just for who you've worked with and recorded with and recorded for. Like it's it's unbelievable, Tony. Oh, you're very kind. Yes, it's all. It's still all sinking in and kind of a little surreal to me too so i'm right there with you <laughs> well 1985 did you get to go to live aid or did you not during no that? i didn't and i didn't know that uh, that they were doing it especially as led zeppelin so that was a surprise to me <laughs> oh my god you didn't even know about it no no i didn't uh, i didn't know about it that's all good yeah well, Queen was there, so that would have been good for you, though. <laughs> that would have well, been really I watched good. that. Yeah, I was back in England at the time and uh, and watched it. And, of course, Queen owned it, and I knew it at the mm-hmm. time. But history has even proved that to be certainly the case. And, uh, yeah, what a, what an amazing event. But I actually, you know, it's, I knew more about Led Zeppelin at that point. And uh, I was like, wow, that didn't go well for them. I felt bad, bad for him because... Tony Thompson, they played drums, and uh, Phil Collins, you know, they did the thing, and two drummers, even those colossal players, couldn't take the place of of John Bonham, bless them both. And uh, but it was, I, I, I was feeling for Jimmy at that point. It's like wow, but you know, still, it was for the cause, wasn't it? It was right. an amazing event, and yeah, I can see it like it was yesterday. Mm. Mm. I, I, honestly, Freddie Mercury. I, I mean, I will die thinking about him 
singing. I, I was so fortunate. I got to see Queen with Freddie six times. Oh. And, and the first time was at a 2,200-seat venue in England. Oh, my God. And I, I managed to fight my way up to the front, and I got drenched with Freddie's champagne. I caught one of the carnations he threw out. And uh, and it, I was 15 years old at the oh time, and it changed my, my life and set my course the vision, I mean, I was already playing music at that point, I was playing gigs with my parents' band, but seeing them that close up, it was it was life-changing. And then I saw them, uh, some of their last shows at Wembley Stadium in 1986, and honestly, it was it was not as enjoyable for me, because we were, had good seats, but we're way back, and so they were specs, and and Time has shown what an incredible performance that was, watching the videos. But at the time, especially after having the intimacy of those earlier shows in the beginning, it didn't have that charm and intimacy and magic for me. But still, oh, Queen were just just the best. And he was probably the best front man ever. Oh, hands down. Hands down completely. You were recently yeah. just talking about when you performed alongside Pink Floyd's David Gilmore and Kate Bush in 1987 for this summer's literal sensation of running up that hill because of the Stranger Things series, that song's made over $2 million just this summer. And Kate put herself in the best position possible because she owns all of the rights to that song and all of the rights to all of her music. Now, did you know in 1987 that Kate would be considered a pioneer and really almost a one of a kind for an artist owning a hundred percent of their music. Well, no, I mean you can't know those things. It's uh, would she have known that uh, what four or five decades later that would she would be as big, if not bigger, than she's ever been in her life? But I, I you, you can never anticipate that thing. I mean, I would never anticipate that something a performance, a one-off performance I did 35 years ago would be getting all this attention now because, you know, she was she didn't perform much live back in those days, which she doesn't, still doesn't. She's not a fan of it. And so I think that is the only live performance from those days. So would we have known that we'd even be talking about this now? But kudos to her for being smart to uh to own all of that and uh you know she's she's amazing so do you still keep in touch with her do you have any plans of reconnecting i've i've not been in touch with her for years i mean you know she, that night was it was all very surreal and there's so many funny stories attached to that but both of us were incredibly shy i mean she she is just a sweetheart, and she, uh, you know, we we went in there with a mission. We probably rehearsed the song three times, and uh, and and then went in and did it, and it and it turned out great. And uh, and so, yeah, I I got a kiss on the cheek at the end of the night from her, and my life was made. So it was <laughs> it was a very surreal but very amazing evening. And what an incredible performance! But you were shy. <laughs> well, this is it. You'd never know. I mean, you look at all that stuff. I mean, I, I well, that's that's the nickname is fretless monster. Is not only about the bass. I mean, fretless, of course, means worry, worry free, no worries. And so, I like the concept of the worry free monster. But you know, when it comes to being on stage, I'm I'm animated. I'm I'm full of fire, and so. You know, get the get the bass in my hands, and I I come alive, and I yeah, I, I just deliver. So I become a bit of a monster. But off stage, I'm just kind of this quiet, chill guy. I've I've come out of my shell a bit the last few years, so I'm I'm doing better in that regard. <laughs> well, that's that's good. <laughs> you, yeah, you know, it's uh, it's it's a whole long story once again. There's so many long stories about my life and my upbringing, and uh, you know that people people assume that you you're just this. Yeah, you know, I'm a rock star. I'm this legendary musician. That you're you live your life a certain way, and you're you know you're, it's all that stuff. There's these misconceptions and everything. But 
I battled a lot of shyness, but a lot of that came from years and years of bullying growing mm. up and a lot of stuff that I had to deal with that really was very, very difficult. And so, you know, I, I deal with challenges that everybody or different people deal with. I'm just as human as, uh, as, as anybody, even though I have this, you know, perception and this, people say I'm a, a legend. I say, well, I'm a legend. And so, <laughs> you know, I, I try to just make fun of it all and keep it all in perspective. But, you know, I, I do these rock and roll fantasy camps quite a bit where I'm a rock star counselor and uh, we have one coming up at the end of this year in, in November in New York City. Those are worth, those are a fun thing. And so I'm actually conducting the orchestra and writing the charts as well as being a counselor. For, and we're performing the whole of Sergeant Pepper's live. Wow. And so anyway, that, that's a whole other thing. But we all give master classes, all the counselors, and they have great counselors. There's Vinnie Apice, there's Rudy Sarzo, there's oh, many, many friends and other uh, musicians that are part of that. Well, we give these master classes. I give a bass one, of course, but the other one that I give, which is always well attended, is handling stage fright and everyday stress. Mm -hmm. And people want to know about that stuff. And I have had firsthand experience of dealing with stage fright and everyday stress because one of the things that happens when you should we say, lose all the substances and the crutches that you use, the, the, the you know, the drinking and all that to, to hide all your anxieties, that is that when you're clear and clean, then all those anxieties and, and, and insecurities come right to the front of your consciousness. And so getting back on stage in the early 90s was terrifying for me, talking to people and dealing with people and remember, this is the days before the internet, the days before the phones and, and Facebook and, and being able to text people. You had to meet people and actually talk to them and, and speak to people on the phone. It was, it was terrifying for me. And so I, have, I had to learn how to perform on stage again and how to interact with people you know, naturally with meditation, with yoga, with breathing and all that stuff, people want to know about that stuff because these are demanding times, they're stressful times. And so, you know, it's, it's something that we all deal with at some level. And I've had to, if I wanted to continue in music and have a career, then I've had to learn how to deal with that. And so I, I share a lot of that stuff. I'm writing a book about it, and people really want to know about it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just as human and as prone to stress and worries and challenges as, just as much as anyone else. Yeah. Well, that's, I'm sure so many people listening right now are taking that and saying, wow, well, like even Tony has stuff he has to deal with, of course. I mean... Life, yeah, life yeah. is hard it's, sometimes. It's real. And life is, life is hard. Now, in 2015, you were part of Van Halen's final tour ever. You were a part of Kenny Wayne Shepherd's band October 4th of 2015 at the Hollywood Bowl. Was Eddie Van Halen's final stage performance. Were you there that night? I was, yes. Yeah, I was front row. And, uh, you know, Eddie was, and the whole band were in, great form. He was just having a blast. And I actually didn't stay the whole night that night. I saw the first couple of songs because I saw it. We played uh, probably six weeks of shows with him. And so we got to see the show many, many times in, in different venues. And I saw most of the show two nights before because we played two nights at the Hollywood Bowl with them. And that last night, I wanted to get a head start on getting home. Nobody knew this is last show, of course. Nobody would. Mm -hmm. But he was just, uh, yeah, what a sweet guy. He was just uh, in rare form and playing so fluidly, so great, so relaxed, and 
having fun. But yeah, nobody nobody would have known. But yeah, we were right there. Now, did you ever have a great connection with him that you were able to spend some time with Eddie? Not really. No, no, I, I didn't. You know, uh, it just didn't happen that way. And there are reasons for that, which, uh, which are not to do with him, but to do with me, my own insecurities and, and stuff that, and uh, start, don't want to get into all that, but you know, the, a lot of the bullying stuff comes up and that's me, not him. So we did chat a few times. We never really got deep with it. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sorry you did go through all that. I mean, that's nobody should have to go through all no, that. No, 10 years of it straight. I mean, it's like from being a very young age and it definitely affects you. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I still deal with that. I've done, I've done therapy. I've done counseling for it. And uh, it's, it's real. I mean, I can be walking down the street and a certain look or a vibe, you see somebody or the lighting or something, it can trigger off a whole traumatic response. And so I literally have to reason with myself. First of all, I breathe and be in the moment. And I say, look, there's no bull charging at you. There's no speeding train coming at you. No speeding car. There's nobody holding a gun to your head. You're okay. You're safe. And so it's like that stuff is deep. And, you know, back in this, we're talking about the 70s in Britain. And there was no, it's not like today. And anybody who might be experiencing bullying or that, reach out to help, for help. Please speak to somebody. I didn't. I kept it all to myself. And you know, back then, you know, it was just, uh, I figured that's just how it is. 70s England is like, uh, it almost felt like the Victorian days to me now <laughs> looking back. Yeah. You know, reaching out for help. Oh, gosh, no, you couldn't do that. Show your emotions and all that. <laughs> but that was a th- that I wasn't mean, I a thing. I it, but it was very different. But if people mm-hmm. are dealing with that now, you know, I know that kids do at school, then, you know, you've got to watch, watch for the signs of your young ones and all that. It is very real, and it affects you. It affects people for the rest of their lives. And uh, even with counseling and meditation and all that, getting past it, it's very deep and it's very real. Well, honestly, here in the States, it, 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 you didn't talk about anything, really. You didn't do that. That wasn't sure. something, you, you just didn't talk about stuff like that. What do you mean somebody's trying to beat you up? Just go to school. I mean, it's it was just not something that was able to be brought up. So thank you for sharing again that with us because who you know who knew and you just don't know. And I always say it to everybody. You don't know what the person next to you has gone through or is going through. Yeah. And if anything, it's made me more, oh, just, I guess, more empathetic, more, more, try to be more understanding as people. Because you don't, as you said, you don't know what people are going through. Everybody's got something. Everybody's got a bag of, of crap that they're hauling around and, and, and stuff that they're dealing with. And so, you know, we should just all be kinder and more to, more patient. But it's sometimes easier said than done, isn't it? But uh, it's all part of that humbling process of getting to know yourself and being... Because, you know, it's very easy to get into the highs of being on stage at Madison Square Garden and think, yeah, hey, aren't I great? Well, no, no, no. You, you're just like everybody else. And so it's... Uh, a wonderful thing really if you can if you can stand back and see it from the right perspective and it's wonderful that you were able to do that because as we know there are musicians who could not step outside well i yeah i mean it's i i lived that at the very highest level i mean as i said about having our own plane our own limos touring i mean we never did a sound check with the firm we we did the production rehearsal for a week or so with all the techs, and I had John, I believe it was John Paul Jones's tech, and we had the crew that was the best of the best. I never had to get on stage after that and do a sound check, and everything, without fail, every single night was perfect. Wow. My instrument was perfectly set up. I didn't have to do a thing. It was like that. Night after night. And it's very easy to take that for granted. 
but to have it at that level with those kind of people and and all that goes with it, yes, not too many people get to experience that. So I'm very grateful for it. It's incredible. Total, totally beautiful thing for you. Now, in 2020, Joel Hoekstra of White Snake Share and TSO, we love Joel. We absolutely love him. Yes, he, he's wonderful. He put together a virtual recording session of a redo of Deep Purple's Stormbringer to benefit Six String Salute to help crew members during the world shutdown because absolutely everyone was affected. Now, the master himself, Glenn Hughes, you're both from Northern England and you played on his 1992 album, LA Blues Authority volume two now glenn was a fan of yours which is how you got to work with him do you remember the day he asked you to be a part of his project oh yeah yeah i do and it's like wow amazing yes i would i mean it's like no second second thought and i was a I was actually a big fan of his from the trapeze days wow and uh so loved glenn yes we're both from a Similar kind of region, and we're like, uh, you know, just brotherly love we have between us. I love Glenn. So he was, he let me do my thing and wanted to, you know, he was re emerging. That was a new chapter for him as well. And so he played bass on probably half the album. I did the rest of it. He just wanted a different influence, and he, he loved my playing, and so, which was incredible to hear. So, yeah, that was just that was just beautiful and amazing. We've been very close ever since. He's so great. I love Glenn. He's he's a gem. He really is. So from Roy Harper to White Snake to Kenny Wayne Shepherd, clearly you are a huge enough talent to move from one genre to another. In nineteen ninety six you were part of Donna Lewis's debut album, Now in a Minute, which contains the single that went both gold and platinum. I Love You Always and Forever. And that song appeared in an episode of Beverly Hills 90210, of course, one of my favorite TV shows in the 90s. <laughs> yes. Now, in, in 1996, it was the most played single on the radio. And I feel like, this is just something weird, I feel like that song could be another running up that hill. What do you think about that? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's funny. You can never tell with, with songs and cycles. I mean, maybe Stranger Things will continue into the 90s, but uh, it's it definitely has that uh, kind of timeless longevity to it. Obviously, it's a very different sentiment and emotion to to running up that hill, which just hit with the right spark and the right issues, if you like, or emotional content. Yeah, I mean, it has been covered. I believe an Australian artist had quite a big hit with it. I, I'm not 100% sure, but it absolutely feels like one of those uh, songs. And you mentioned Beverly Hills 90210. There is that episode is, and that performance is on YouTube, and you can see me. It, people won't even recognize me, but they are, I'm wearing the shades, I've got the short hair, and looking very mid nineties, but you can see it's me because I'm, I've got my still playing the firm fretless bass on that. And there's performances of me with, with Donna on, on uh, Kathy Lee and Re Regis and Kathy Lee and Rosie O'Donnell. And now Donna and I go back a long, long time. Our friendship with, with each other and her husband was so solid for years before that. And so it was just such a joy to be doing that with her. So, so much fun. So, yeah, you never know with music. It definitely has its cycles. Um, you never know. I mean, it's like the firm could, could come back and uh, have a moment. You just never know. You don't. I mean, I could see Radioactive popping up somewhere, too. Like, oh, my gosh, it's in this movie. I mean, that would be yeah. so cool. Yeah, and satisfaction guaranteed. I mean, that's, a, that's such a, mm -hmm. a vibe. And what about live in peace. I mean, can we have a more timely mm. and powerful message than that? And it's such a fantastic song. You just never know with things. You, you never know. And like, you never, who who knew you were going to be working with Lou Graham, <laughs> another icon from this Yeah, that's right. And he's, oh, so, well, you, you've spoken to him a number of times. He's such a, a sweet soul and mm -hmm. such a, an incredible journey that he's had. I mean, Honestly, I, I love Lou 
so much. I, I have so much respect for him. I mean, just growing up listening to him and watching him and just looking at him and hearing him. It, I, I just think he is one of our biggest icons that we have today from our generation. And, and he really is. And, and there's not so many of those left, to be honest. I mean, right. putting it bluntly, he's, he's the voice that did it. And actually, I was very fortunate to work with another icon the year before that, which is John Fogarty. Oh, wow. I did, I did quite a bit of uh, touring with, with him, really filling in for James Lomenzo, who, uh, who was his longtime bassist at the time, and now, of course, has gone on to to Megadeth full time, but another icon and an incredible catalog. So I, I, here's the thing, though, Kiki. I mean, growing up in England, Credence and both Foreigner were never, they, they were known a bit, but they were never broke through like they did in America. And so I, it was like almost learning a whole new catalog of songs for me. And going back and learning those things, well, talk about feels like the first time. I mean, it was like I was learning a lot of those songs and hearing them for the first time. Wow. And so it was, and then you discover, oh, oh, yeah, that was then they recorded that. And oh, oh, yeah. And, uh, and so it's like, it's a joy for me to go back and learn a lot of the American catalog, a lot of the stuff that escaped me. Uh, largely the first time around. So I feel so fortunate. I mean, Lou he is an absolute, one of the kindest, most sweetest, and most talented guys I, I could ever wish to, to be beside on stage. I just adore him. I know you do. And you. he's, the fact he's still doing it with all that he went through. I mean, you know, he, as you know, he, he overcame uh, an egg-sized ch brain tumor. He was sent home twice as being inoperable and was bas basically, that was it. And he found a way and he came back and he's loving what he's doing. He's having so much fun. He's happy and healthy and has such a great, and he, he's so giving with the fans. I mean, at the end of each night, he'll go and stand out by the merch table, sign things, such a, a kind and giving soul. It's I feel I feel privileged and blessed to be working mm -hmm. and playing with him. It, it, he is something else. It, it it's so true. And you know what? You really don't find that with most artists today. You you, you just don't. And he, no, I know he is just in love with his fans, and I find that. That's how you know the appreciation is there and that he's just completely humbled and thankful for, you know, how he's gotten to where he's gotten to today. And he's been able to stay where he is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it, he is definitely a rarity. I mean, just with all he's been through and where he's at now, it's, uh, yeah, I could talk and, and sing his praises all night. It's It's incredible. Now, did you ever get to work with Journey or Steve Perry? Like, did you know about them in England? or Because really, Foreigner and Journey, those were the two bands. I mean, did you get to listen to their music? Or? No, they were not really known in Britain either. So a few bands did not uh, did not make it across there or translate so well. And, and Journey, I, I know very little about them, to be honest. Wow. <laughs> That's insane to me. <laughs> It, and it's just, I find it so interesting that some groups really took off overseas and not here and vice versa. And you're pure living proof of, you're, you're saying it. You're like, you didn't even know Foreigner, really. Yeah. And, and I mean, even Bad Coal, I mean, they did not translate. And Free, of course, British, and they, they, they were big in Britain. And so it's, it's, it's fascinating. It really is. Yeah, there's a band that I loved growing up and I can't say they ever got to huge awareness to to, to, to the masses but a band called Bebop Deluxe mm -hmm. and um, they I love them I just love that band and a handful of people know about them out here and so yeah but it's there's quite a few bands that did not 
cross over to to the UK from the States. Now, after working with literally hundreds of amazing and iconic musicians, what is the one thing, Tony, that you feel has given you staying power in this industry? Yes, very, very good question. Well, I still have immense joy and love for creating music and and playing bass. And creativity is what drives drives me on. And yeah, I I cannot avoid, but you know, meditation and and all that, the spiritual life for me is the the real foundation and I, I wanna even say the purpose for it all for me. And so you know, it's an evolving journey, and and I've always written and created, and I still fight, feel like I have so much to say and do musically and creatively. In some ways, even with my my history and yeah, you know, my resume, I still feel like I have so much I want to do creatively. And so, in the along the way, you just keep going and. Because that's the spark of it. It all has to come from within yourself and loving what you do. I mean, I can I can remember those first times of playing music from being five years old. I was born into a musical family. My parents played. And from the very get-go, music just electrified me and made me feel alive. And I still feel that way about it. I mean, it's just, it's. I'm thankful for that because I know for some people that that changes, but it hasn't for me. And so, you know, in the process of that, I guess along the way, I've I've done some amazing things and played with some incredible people. And, you know, I mentioned meditation because that makes me feel clear. It makes me feel more creative. It makes me feel like I'm in touch with my real self because, you know, the outside, the body, the mind, life, circumstances – are always changing. It's just inevitable, right? You know, we, we get older, we evolve, we think differently, we have life challenges, we have circumstances, the business changes. Everything is evolving and changing. It's just part of life. But me, is still inside. I'm, I'm that spark, that, that spark of life, of creativity, of energy, of light, whatever you want to call it that's, that's within me, that feels just the same as it did when I discovered music when I was, before I even knew I discovered it. And so that is what keeps driving me on and and making me love this elusive thing called music and creativity, which still challenges me and excites me and inspires me every single day. And... I appreciate that so much because you're part of the reason why all of us are here. You know, music means everything to this community that we have here. And it brings us joy. It it just, like you said, light and happiness. And we thank you for being able to give us that. Well, thank you. I, and I thank you, Kiki, because I know that I mentioned rather maybe a little cheekily that if you can think of some different angles and different things, because I do get asked a lot of the similar questions because I have a lot of incredible moments that people want to know about and I'm happy to share, but a lot of the time it gets to be the same questions. And you've asked some very thoughtful and insightful questions and, uh, I, I really appreciate that. So I love sharing and, um, you know, there's still, there's a lot to share. And, uh, I, as you can tell, I'm a little bit of a philosophical deep thinker and, uh, <laughs> and I, I love this thing called life with its ups and downs. And I love the whole process and, and reflecting on it all and sharing and hopefully being an inspiration and a, and a light along the way. 
And you definitely are. And I have to tell you, just off the cuff here, you know, people were emailing me, Tony is such a sweet guy. He's such a humble man. And people are in love with you. And you have had such an incredible career. And I feel so honored that you talk to me tonight and and to our whole community because I know that you don't do a lot of interviews. So I truly appreciate it. I did try to take the time to go in different directions for you but we appreciate you you always reach out to your fans too on twitter on social media and that is also so appreciated and it just you know goes to the fact that you do love what you do and everybody can find you at your website fretlessmonster.com on facebook as well as instagram and twitter and again say hi to tony everybody just go and find him we'll be looking for you to perform somewhere near us with lou and the all-stars and tony seriously thank you so so much yeah and thank you for mentioning the social media yes that's all me i like to be hands-on i i like to interact and i don't have anybody you know, doing that stuff for me because to me it's it kind of takes away the what it's supposed to be. And I know that there are practicalities and real realities of you know a lot of people being able to manage their own stuff. So, but as much as I can, I always reply, and I love I love interacting with uh, with all the fans. And thank you to all of you that are listening. Uh, you you're some of the best best fans ever. I appreciate you all, and uh, have some amazing comments and positive words and it, it means the world it really does thank you tony bye tony hey, you, still, you still there yeah i'm yeah. still here tony bye thank you very much all right great thank you i love you tony love you too thanks for the time bye bye, -bye. Tony. bye, -bye. okay bye bye bye, -bye. bye.